Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. Hey, everybody. So today we're going to talk about should we build tools that are subscription-based versus one-time fees? Um, it's it's a great topic. Hey, it's uh, Jackie here from uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. And Joe Glines from Dallas, Texas. So today we're, as I just said, we're going to talk about should you build tools that are subscription-based versus a one-time fee or perpetual licenses. Um, so yeah, let's let's jump into that. So I'd say the first one here is subscription lowers entry costs. So not so big, so easy to try. So that that's I, I'd say people would be more inclined to maybe try out a subscription based thing because that tenor or or whichever level you put your subscription at might not wait so hard versus you having a product that costs a hundred right because if let's say you had some kind of money back in T or something like that, it's still very early in the process. People may not yet trust or whatever you'd call that. They don't have a relationship to your brand yet. Um, sure enough, you could have free trials and stuff like that. But uh, we talked about in another uh, podcast about support and stuff like that. And free trials can be heavy on your support if the stuff you have is uh, very niche so you might need to help your customers or they they might want a lot of support to get up and running and if you at least have them uh, hooked on a subscription uh, with that low entry point would be yeah yeah, it's all about um, reducing risk, right? I think, especially, in, and you nailed it, Jackie, with uh, if people don't know your brand, if you're not a corporate, you know, corporation where people know your name, how do they know that even though you say money back guaranteed, like you're going to give them their money back, right? So when it's a big dollar fee, that's a lot more at risk. But it, now if the person knows you, that that's very different, right? But most of the time they're not going to know you. So it, it's very... Um, uncertain so you can minimize that risk by charging a smaller amount and letting people try it out or often have the first month even free right make it a no a no fee or uh, actually i wouldn't say don't go with no fee right we we, jack and i both know that that doesn't work out great because you bring in people who don't pay anything and they complain a lot so maybe charge a dollar right uh to to first get the thing set up and you kind of get rid of the i'll call it trash for lack of better you know thinking term uh, but you'll bring in really qualified people and then let them have a, a bit of time at the beginning to just try it out and make sure it's a good fit, right? Because especially with software, usually there's not fees that we're incurring. So let us take on the risk. The more you take on the risk instead of the consumer, the more likely they are to actually try. As long as you have a good product, hey, it, it's a good, you know, they'll stick with you. Yeah, and I'd say it. it the, the idea of having people, let's say, start a subscription or whatever they're starting, um, at least giving you your their credit information or whatever they're doing, um, puts them at least a little inside of just giving it away totally for free, right? So yeah, um, that that just having a little bit of an entry bar. I understand the, the reason that people want trials and all that stuff. But if you have something that's a little bit involved, where support might be a given, have something that at least um, costs, just as Joe said, a dollar or something like that. Have something where they're putting something on the line. It makes it much easier to actually work with them afterwards because they're not just complaining for that free product or they're not just dropping off mid uh, support session or whatever because you know what 
I don't want to use any more time on this. And you just used an hour right. or, or whatever you use, right? It, it's have them at least. Um, a little, as we say, something. something in the game. A, a little, you know, yeah. a little bit of something from them gets them to where they're not going to just bail on you for no reason whatsoever. Um, the, the next one, which is interesting, it can be that perpetual, it's a one and done thing. So it's in some ways it's quote unquote easier. However, if you have a good tool, like we use these digital downloads for, for selling stuff, uh, it takes care of everything. So in our, in our case, I don't think necessarily it, it really matters, right? Now, granted, we are paying for a tool that will keep up and do the recurring fees and keep track of licenses and a lot of other crap. But um, it, you know, not everyone has a tool that they like and can use. Uh, and so it can be a hassle to keep charging people at regular intervals. It can, and and with the perpetual one, let's say you made, I I don't know, an automation of a a specific Facebook functionality. Who knows what it is? Something that you know works right now, and it's it's great value. People would love to have it, and you sell it at a one-time fee. And then you continue on to working on the next thing that you like a lot. Let's say that this, uh, uh, that Facebook makes a large update uh, six months after uh, you had your big uh, sales push. You, You might not need to actually prioritize fixing it as quickly as you would with a big subscription base because if if you have a subscription base and the thing isn't working they would quickly drop off and you would lose a lot of the lifetime value or income that a user would generate whereas with the perpetual one they have already paid that one given amount. And uh, the only thing that you're struggling to is to maintain some kind of brand integrity or keeping new customers coming in. So depending on whichever situation you're in, absolutely perpetual is easier in a lot of ways. Well, and I, and I think it's a really, really good point, Jackie. Um, there's just different, there's multiple levels to what you just said that, that I, I'd like to, you know, throw in, add on to what you said, because I, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, but it's, look, if, if you have told people the tool works now, and, and as long as there's minor updates, it'll keep working, you know, for forever, blah, blah, blah. Um, now, if, but if you say if Facebook does a complete redesign, we're, you know, we're not on the hook for that. Right. So because if you're also, like you said, worried about your brand image, people might expect a refund, you know, for this perpetual license tool. And you might be suddenly out a crap load of money, you know, if you don't fix it. Right. Um, now, the the other thing is you could say uh, it, it gets back to and how did you handle the, the changes and, you know, and, and are you going to keep it updated and working um, with uh, the uh, month to month? You might just say, like, Jackie, can you imagine the sense that something major changes in the workforce and the company that you're doing something with makes a huge change and your business goes to crap? Um, and suddenly, yeah. you, you, um, if you had only sold perpetual licenses and all those people came back to you and said, I want a refund, you know, the month the month, you're like, I'll refund you this month. You know what? I'll refund everyone this last month and I'm done, right? And you don't have this big yeah. ticket this big cost, you know, possibility. So uh, there's there's pros and cons to both. It is a really good point of, boy, if you are doing a perpetual license, be very clear on, you know, how long it's good for and the types of changes. Um, we, we actually did one for a client doing stuff with the IMDB database. And they unfortunately made changes a couple of weeks, big changes a couple of weeks after we did this stuff. And we said, look, you know, that's outside, that's unfortunately not our, our problem so to speak um it it sucks but it's web scraping and you don't have apis unfortunately and it's the way it is and thankfully it was a custom thing that the person understood too of like it it sucks but it's it wasn't our fault that the imdb changed their website Um, 
Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the thing, right? I, I'd say that the next one we have here is uh, the support aspect of a perpetual, which means you could end up supporting all the versions forever. Right? If you give people a, a one-time last forever license and here you have a version, and if that version isn't tied into something that is prone to change and let's say it's it's a completely uh, separate uh, entity that you can use like let's say it was word um you could i'm not sure if you could use the first versions of word but at least many of the pre-cloud versions you could probably still install and use today um if i had 30 floppy disks yeah <laughs> Which yeah, I'm and running them through. But yeah, right. if if Microsoft didn't have those end of support for Windows, whatever version number it was, where they might give you ten years after you make that initial purchase of support, it, they found out pretty quickly that they need to have a finite amount of time they would support a given version because they are so large and they have so many versions out there and none of their windows versions prior to 10 maybe really had um, that expectation of an internet connection they were supposed to work out of the box locally and you should be able to phone in to get support for that version because you had paid that perpetual price once. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they even decided, you know what, even if we give our darn OS away as a free upgrade, it's just, it makes more sense to just get as many people up to the new system, the new OS, instead of still supporting people on the older ones, you know, forever, right? It's just... Let's migrate them up. And that way we keep one running, you know, solid and don't have all of these that we keep offering support to forever. Yeah, and, and they probably, uh, they didn't probably, they also made it much more internet aware, mm-hmm. right? It, it pinged home quite a lot more, um, stuff like that. So uh, with with people being on the newest version, it, it gave Microsoft's uh, a lot of options. Whereas if they had just said, oh, you bought that once. Yeah, I remember back in 1997, uh, we saw that. Sure, we we're going to support that. Right? It, the, the people who programmed it or knew it are half dead. Most of them were moved on to other things. So, yeah. That, that's, well, and I, I think a good sense. point to add on to that, Jackie, is regardless of which approach you take it's really in your best interest if you can get some sort of an email address or some way to connect to that customer right and have a way that you can reach back out to them for just business purposes right because you can upsell them in some ways and there's a lot of stuff you can do with when you have a list right so it, it's it's a really great thing to do to make sure you can in some way reach out to them and understand how you know communicate with them um, yeah now yeah the next one, oh sorry go ahead no, that's fine, Joe. Go. Cool. Well, the next one was you just discussing about um, which ones earn more, right? And I don't know, I haven't read studies on it, but I think it's pretty clear since everyone loves, you know, switching to a subscription-based thing. I think in reality, those, you know, it's the, the, the taxes here in the U.S. used to be a once-a-year thing. And then they, it, it wasn't even taken out of your paycheck. And then they realized they can get more money, you know, if they take it out slowly over time. And so they started taking out of every paycheck. And I, I think it's just very proven that if you continually make it small bites, it's much easier to get a lot more than taking one big bite. Yeah, we've had that forever with with the, each month. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it is what it is. But yeah, I, I'd say... I had software, um, it isn't as popular as it once was, but it was for years. And I must say, being able to sell a subscription like that, the 
level of income are reached with minimal effort. I put a lot of effort into the code and, and support and the selling of it. But when it was living in its own life and people were coming in from all the advertising and stuff like that, I could have made a large payday right there. But instead, I ended up getting income for a long period of time, which made it seem like a much more viable way of making income. Just the, the, the scale that that could reach was astronomical. So I do understand why you would go for the low entry price and because people just keep them, they keep their Netflix uh, account, even if they don't use it or HBO account or whichever thing we're talking about here. It could be so many different things. If the price is low enough, people might not really unsubscribe. The same for fitness uh, memberships and all kinds of other uh, magazine memberships or whatever it might be. Yeah, and businesses, when they really start looking at lifetime customer value, and that's where you look at, you know, how much money do you actually earn? For most businesses, they, they often pick like three years as the general rule of thumb of how long I might have a customer. It's obviously very different in different industries, different things, but let's just stick with three years. Um, when you do a one-time purchase, you're done, right? But when you're doing things monthly and then your chances to upsell, because one of the other great ways to make more money off of people is to upsell them, give them different opportunities to buy different things. And again, when you do that once and you're done, it doesn't give you a lot of opportunities to upsell. But if you're continually having a relationship with them and the people are coming back and you can offer them other things, it's just a lot easier to to get find ways to get more money from them, which is for most businesses, their, their end goal, right? Of course, you want to help people too. Don't get me wrong, right? But yeah, that recurring fees is a great way to be doing that stuff. Yeah, and, and to me, it's hard to know which one earns more because I haven't had much experience with... Uh, the perpetual version of stuff uh, I've gone with the subscription every time. Uh, but as, as most things are shifting over to the subscription version, someone somewhere has crunched all the numbers and seen that this is probably the way to go. Um, I'd say that the last one we have here is should you offer both? And I, I just saw an example of that yesterday, maybe where I could get that basic version, that licensed version, one, I don't remember, year of support. And every time I renewed, I'd still get the support. Um, but I could also get access to more features and uh, uh, what's it called? It's still support, but um, at a higher priority. Um, and... That was kind of the middle, the most popular, or that was at least what they said. And then they had the third one that was the forever one, right? It's, it's a one time more expensive than the rest of them. Not so much more expensive than the middle one, but still pretty expensive, which just gave me a lifetime uh, license, lifetime basic support stuff like that which probably makes sense if you expect people to have a finite lifetime value right? if you only expect people to stay around for two years right. because the, let's say this was this was a plugin for a website um, so if most websites that don't grow big only really exist and is active for two years, that might be something they have crunched the numbers on. It might make good sense to try and get that little bit extra when people are ready to buy. Right. I have a great story um, that ties in with that. My grandfather, now granted, this is when I was like 13 or so, right? Um, maybe, have you ever heard of the Die Hard Battery from Sears? 
it was a, it was a really big brand 30, 40 years ago. Right. Mm-hmm. And he bought this battery. They offered a lifetime, you know, battery for a car. Right. Um, and so my grandfather bought it for his truck. Now, most people, they, they did research and said, most people sell their cars within three to five years, whatever. Right. So they're like, well, Hey, this is a great, we'll get a lot of people to spend money up front. And it was, I don't, I don't know prices right from back then, but it was a sizable amount of money, but he bought it and he went back. I can't remember how many times, I think he said somewhere between five to eight times to get new batteries. Um, and the last time he went in, I remember him telling me this, cause like he went in and the guy's like, this is your eighth battery you've gotten to it from, you know, for us. And he's like, well, you offered me a lifetime supply for my truck, which was really, it was really old truck, but he just kept it forever. Mm-hmm. And he finally said, I lit him off the hook because they get, you know, I got, <laughs> you know, so much value for this. And, and he said, I finally just said, I, he said, he still kept the truck, but he just said he didn't feel comfortable like going back. He's like, all right, you know, whatever. Um, as hey, a teenager, hey, I was hey. like, what do you mean? Sorry. But now I get it. Yeah, exactly. I I recently read an in uh, a story kind of the same as you said, and I don't remember the names correctly, but I think it was uh, Sinclair sewing machines. Mm, yep. Uh, that were so well made, uh-huh. they were made in the forties and the fifties, uh-huh. that the company ended up having to go out and buy the sewing machines uh, secondhand <laughs> to get them off the market just because yeah. nobody was buying new ones. They yeah. could get a perfectly mint condition working one down in the secondhand store because it didn't matter if it had been running for 30 years. It right. still worked just as well. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you, you can also make uh, some some issues for yourself there. Right. So be careful when you, when you do offer something forever, um, you know, maybe have some, some rules in there or something in there. I'm, I'm, we're not saying purposely make it break. Right. But just be understanding what you're offering. Maybe you know, I think it'd be realistic to say, Hey, the tool you have forever, the support ends in five years. Right. Like, and I think most yeah. people be like, we get, you can't keep this around support around forever, but the tool, you know, why would you, suddenly say the license expires after five years right if it's still working so awesome i hope that y'all give you some good thoughts about which way you want to go and why yeah absolutely have a good night cheers yeah bye